Afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the community track. Uh, this is our last talk down here. Um, obviously, got the keynote afterwards. And uh, for anyone who didn't know, we've got a social at the end of the day with cinema and a jazz band. Um, yeah, uh, but I'd like to hand over to Sean Kelly from Rapid7. Um, he's going to talk about using Go Test. So. Uh, yeah, hi. So, uh, as you said, my name is Sean. Um, everyone calls me Stabby. If you were at my other talk, you would know that. Um, there's my Twitter handle up there. I talk on Twitter all day with people, so if you like my talk or you hate my talk, feel free to tweet at me about it. Um, so, we're here to talk today about Go Test and specifically what happens under the hood when you run it. Um, so, while I give this talk, uh, you're going to notice there's a bunch of pictures of my awesome dog, uh, but also I have a sort of repo that I set up called Quiz because uh, it's like a test, but it's not test because that's a special word. Um, there are certain examples in there that I'm going to link to at the bottom of my slides, so you can check those out either now if you like to be on your laptops or your phones during talks, or you can check them out later. Um, I'm also going to have other sort of relevant links to things inside of Go internal, uh, so specifically links to like the Go test tool and uh, other stuff, um, just to sort of reinforce where the code is that I'm sort of talking about. Um, I want to define a little bit what this talk isn't about. Um, so specifically, it's not really about testing methodologies. Uh, it's not really about testing libraries or frameworks that aren't just the standard library. Uh, it's not really about assertions or whether you should use them or not. I really don't care. Um, it's also not about whether or not you should write tests. You should. Um, so there's the end of that section of the talk, write tests. Um, what the talk is about, though, is the go test command specifically. Uh, and how it works, so what happens when you actually run Go test, what does it mean to run a test, and a couple of interesting things that you may or may not know um, from, within, uh, from within the Go test tool itself. Uh, and then I'm going to finish with a cool party trick that you can use to impress your friends if your friends like writing tests. <laughs> Hope, hopefully they do, because that helps to reinforce the message. Um, so test files are where it all begins. That's where he began. Um, so before I dive in a little bit, um, I want to say that any sufficiently deep explanation of how Go test works invariably becomes a discussion about how, how builds work in Go. Uh, and I, one of the things I struggled with a little bit was how deep to go in that discussion. Um, so I'm not going as deep as, hey, here's how files get linked and built and that sort of thing. A little bit of that is touched on. Um, but I keep it a couple of layers above that because I wanted to focus more on the uh, specifics and the peculiarities of Go test itself. And I didn't want to dive into the build process. So for one reason is that I just want to focus on those things that are specific to Go test. But two, I am not smart enough or qualified enough to talk about the build process as a whole. Um, it's a very interesting and complicated matter. And so I'm going to touch on some of that stuff, but I'm not really going to dive into it. So what is a test in Go? Well, basically, it's any file that ends with underscore test uh, is eligible to be a test. Um, Tests contain what I'm going to refer to as the three siblings of testing. There's a test method, which people are mostly familiar with. Uh, and there's sort of a special guest appearance by test main if you really need to tightly control the order in which your tests run or some spe specific setup and teardown uh, instructions. There's benchmarks, which I think most people are familiar with because they're really popular. And it's actually, I think, a way that a lot of people get into writing tests with Go because they have a really, um, a really advanced and great benchmarking capability. And then there's also examples. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time specifically talking about examples, because for me personally, I hardly ever see anybody write these. I also never write them myself. But I also think they're really interesting, because there's a lot of specific quirks and ways that they behave that A, make them kind of difficult to get right, but B, also make them kind of useful. Um, they're really like the canonical way that you would put example code into Godoc. So if you've ever looked at Godoc and you see those runnable examples, what you're actually seeing is sort of a very special type of test known as an example test. So that's what a test is. But what isn't a test? Uh, and this is actually really easy to answer. It's anything that does not end in underscore test.go. Um, that's, that's really it. If, if you don't have it in underscore test.go, Go isn't going to run it as a test full stop. Uh, next slide. Uh, there's also another sort of popular question about whether you want to use an underscore test package or put your tests in your main package. Um, there's also some really interesting stuff you can run into if you start to use test packages, and I'm going to cover a few of those uh, during my talk. My overall opinion, though, here is it doesn't actually matter. Again, just write tests. 
all that time you spend arguing with your coworker about should it go in the test package or should it not go in the test package is time that you could be actually writing and improving your tests. So it doesn't matter. Just write tests however are comfortable for you uh, and you'll be doing very well for yourself. Um, there is a really confusing error that you can run into though uh, if you like to use the underscore test uh, package style. Um, if you don't use the right file name, so for example, if you have a test that is just named uh, bad test and not bad underscore test, you will get an error something like this. Can't load package, package, blah, 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 GitHub, stabby cut you quiz, bad test, that's the name of the example in my package, by the way. Um, found package is bad and bad underscore test, that conflicts. And you might sit there and you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, this, this is supposed to work just fine. Uh, you know, I have a package and a package underscore test. This is supposed to be a supported feature of how you write tests and go. You will sit there and you will bang your head against the keyboard and you will cry and you will be frustrated and you will go back to all of your old projects and you will go over all of your tests with a fine tooth comb looking for the thing inside the test file that you got wrong until finally uh, you will admit defeat and you will call a coworker over and they will look at it for 10 seconds and they will say, oh, you forgot the underscore in your file name uh, and then you will realize that it is very, very important that you name your test correctly. True story. <laughs> So I said that I wanted to talk a little about examples, and the reason why I want to do that is because I feel like they're, they're definitely the least well-known and the least well-used of what I'm sort of calling the, the three siblings. Um, they need a very specific naming structure. And the first time I ever tried to use an example, I couldn't get this right, uh, and I couldn't get the example to work, and then I never went back to using them again until I started to write this talk, uh, because I wanted to sort of revisit it and figure out, like, hey, what was so difficult about that? Why, why couldn't I get that right? And the answer was I, I just really wasn't paying attention properly. Um, so you have to name them in a certain way. So they have to start with example, capital E. The next piece of that word has to be either a function or a structure name. Then you need an underscore, and then it gets a little bit variable. You can either have a method or a field off of that function or struct, or you can have what I'm sort of calling an ordinal placeholder. And if you don't have an ordinal placeholder there and you decide to have a method or field, you can then pre or suffix rather uh, that field or method name with another ordinal. And the important part about that is if you have multiple examples and you want to have multiple examples for the same function or multiple examples for the same uh, field, the way that you do that is you just add another underscore and then you add a second, a third, a fourth, et cetera. Um, it's actually really interesting uh, about how Go considers that final place, that ordinal value, or what I'm calling an ordinal. In all of their examples, they use um, uh, numerical names, so second, third, fourth, et cetera. But it doesn't actually matter what you use there. Like, there's no limit to how high you go because it doesn't actually parse that out to understand it as a number. It's just simply a convention that you would provide those in sort of a numerical order. You could do, you know, uh, your struct, your field name, foo, bar, baz, biz, buzz. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be unique. Um, but conventionally, we typically see these things as uh, ordered with ordinals. So it's just something to sort of consider when you're trying to provide examples and to make it look like all the stuff that you see in maybe the official Godoc packages. Um, there are also two flavors of examples. One is in an individual example, and this sort of very much like it sounds on the tin, it just sort of stands alone. Um, you could have multiple individual examples in a single test file, and that's sort of one way to provide examples. The other way to do it is with what is called whole file examples. And this is again where some of the stuff around examples gets a little tricky because you have to do it very explicitly correctly, which is really a thing in Go in general. If you don't do everything exactly right, Go is typically not super happy with you, and Go test is not that different in this regard. Um, so whole file examples are special because, well, it has to be an underscore test.go file, so that's a bit of a given, but it can only have one single example, fi example function in that file. There can also be no test or benchmark functions in that file, and it has to have at least one other package level declaration. And by that I mean a struct or a function or something like that. There has to be something in there that you're trying to decorate with an example or else it isn't considered a whole file example. There's also another really cool behavior of examples uh, that if you dig into some of the official documentation on them, they start to talk about. Uh, but if you're not really paying attention or if you're just providing examples as a way to just provide examples, you might miss out on this. Um, and it's this really cool way that you can sort of turn them into their own little mini tests and they can be asserted for correctness. There's a specialized comment that you can apply to the bottom of any of your examples. It starts with two slashes like any comment would, a space like comments should, 
and then capital O output colon. One more space, and then after that, you can put whatever is considered the output of the test, or that example, rather, uh, in that comment. And by output, what I mean is something that would use fmt.print, or one of the fmt.print functions. Um, what will happen is, if you provide one of these and it matches, it actually counts as a test passing. And if you don't match it, if, or if the assertion fails, uh, it counts as one of your tests failing. And what's really cool about this is you can actually use it to make sure that your examples don't go out of date over time. Because uh, it's really easy in a lot of ways to have your documentation go out of date. Uh, happens all the time. Every time you make changes and you don't go back and update every single one of your comments, which literally nobody ever does, uh, there's nothing that's really catching you and being like, hey, you're, you're sort of not cleaning up after yourself. You're not being honest with what this comment represents anymore. Examples are a really cool way that you can tie that idea of providing an example piece of code, but it's actually in a way that is both compiled and asserted to be correct, but also, if you do it all right, it ends up in your Go doc as something that can be run so that people can see what it actually does live. Uh, and on this next slide, I've got a couple of examples of what this looks like. Examples, haha. Um, so in my package, uh, you can see sort of the link right there. Um, it's a package called siblings under the quiz package. Um, I have a couple of different examples. One is just to say hi. Uh, and as you'll notice, that one doesn't have an output comment at the bottom. And so this will be compiled, but it will not be run, and it will not be considered a pass or a fail with any of your tests. The next two are an example of how you can do the assertion for the positive and one that will fail. So the first one, uh, if you dig into package siblings, is really just like one method. It just says, hi, says, we are the three siblings of Go testing. So at the bottom of that first one, or that second one, rather, uh, you can see that that is what that output says. So that test will pass, and it will count as a pass test in, hopefully, the test that you run in CI, for example. Uh, but if anybody ever checks that out and runs it locally and wants to use your Go doc, they can also assert that that example is still valid. The bottom example there in the, the third ordinal is one that will fail because it says four and not three, and because the say hi method under the hood prints out to fmt.print, uh, uh, it will, Go will natively match those together and say, oh, hey, these, this is not what the expected output is. This test, this example is considered a failure. So in a lot of ways, your CI build would be considered a failure, I hope anyways. A um, Couple of more examples here of how you would do one uh, with uh, testing a field or how you would do one testing a method. It's very, very similar. Um, so you know, I have this concept of a sibling. It has a name, like your siblings probably do. Uh, this one is named Benchy. Uh, and you can then print Benchy's name. And as long as it is still Benchy, which in this code, there's only two lines, so there's not a lot of room for that to change, that test will assert true. Uh, and again, for functions, you can do the same thing. So in this one, it doesn't really matter what I name the sibling, but I call fight because siblings often fight. I know I had three older siblings, and we fought a lot. Um, however, this will print out a warning that fighting isn't very nice uh, because my mom told me that it wasn't very nice uh, when we fought. Uh, and this is a picture of my dog looking at my JIRA backlog, and I assure you he is incredibly concerned that we're not getting enough done. Uh, so we sort of have to find what a test is, and maybe we've written some tests. What is, what is a test binary? What, is, what actually gets built when you run Go test? Um, and so let's talk a little bit about how that happens. So a test binary is a specialized test that is built, I'm sorry, a specialized binary that is built based off the tests that you provide in your package. Uh, it sort of includes this automatic wrapper that gets produced around all those tests to run them for you. So you don't really have to write you know, all the, the core driving logic to figure out how to find test methods and invoke them and that sort of thing. Go does that for you as long as you meet all the naming conventions. That's sort of why you do capital T test, capital B bench, capital E uh, example with all the, the signatures that, that come to match. Um, one thing that might not be super obvious if you haven't paid close attention is that you actually get one binary per package. So if you have a, a repo that has you know, 100 packages in them and you invoke Go test to do all of your testing over all those packages, that's not one binary. That's 100 test binaries in this sort of crazy case where you have 100 packages all uh, in GitHub under one repo. Um, so those are all built individually, and there's a lot of reasons why they do that, and I'll get into that in a, in a couple of slides. Um, those binaries then get invoked by Go test by running um, OS exec. And then the results are presented to you, which, which sounds all pretty standard, but there's actually some interesting stuff that happens in between those steps um, that I want to cover. So it all starts with running the go test command. And obviously people here, I would hope, have probably run that before, but just to give you a little bit of a, a refresher on it, um, how we run tests is we invoke go tests, and there's, uh, the signature for this uh, invocation is interesting. You can provide a series of build and test flags initially. You can then provide a list of packages, 
And then after that, there's actually an opportunity to provide more flags, but specifically, you can now also provide a second type of flag, which is for the test binary itself. So there's actually two sets of flags uh, that matter when it comes to running tests. There's flags that touch uh, how Go test behaves, and there's flags that touch how your test binary behaves. And there actually, there's a very good reason why they make a distinction around that, because some of them impact how it gets built, and some of them change the behavior of how it runs. Um, but you might sort of say, you know, what does the test command actually do? And to answer that, I actually found uh, where it is in GitHub. It's not really that hard. It's not like I you know, found it like I'm some type of you know, explorer. Um, but I went to uh, internal test test.go to find out exactly what it does. So before I talk about that, the one thing we're always told is, hey, you should probably read the Go doc for anything that you're doing in Go. Go actually put a really strong emphasis around proper documentation. They provide a lot of really strong docs with a lot of really great examples. As gophers, we're sort of told, hey, go look at Go doc. Go find what Go doc tells us. So what does Go doc tell us? Well, not much, because if you go to Go, uh, sorry, uh, CMD Go internal, there actually is no link to a Go doc for the test tool. There are for some other directories and packages in there. Uh, but not the test tool itself. However, if you get clever and you sort of understand the naming convention of these things, you will find that there is actually a page for package test. However, it is effectively empty. There is nothing of value in there whatsoever. It's interesting to look at from an artifact standpoint, but there's really, noth there's really no reason you would have to go there. Uh, and so that's probably one reason why the link doesn't show up on the page. Uh, and this is sort of my face as I was figuring that out. Uh, he's so handsome. So where does the real documentation live? So the reason why that there's no Go doc for this is because the Go test package is not really something that, sorry, let me, uh, not the testing package, but the Go test tool itself. It's not something you're expected to import or to use. Uh-oh, what's happening here? Yeah. There we go, perfect. Okay, that didn't happen. Um, so, as I was saying, um, there's a reason why that you don't get that in the Go doc, and that is because you're not really meant to import it. You're meant to use it like a CLI tool. So the documentation they provide for it is like documentation that would be with any other CLI tool, uh, unless you expect a man page, which is also not there. Um, what you do get, though, is the dash dash help command, and that will display everything that you need to know about tests, including all the flags and the different options you can set, uh, and it's stored in a package level variable inside of this file right here, which is sort of the one that I keep linking to. Uh, and that's why the Go doc is so sparse. And what's actually kind of interesting about that is if you're curious enough to go look at this file, you actually can't even really begin looking at the code until you get through the giant package level variable that has all of the documentation and all of the flags and all of the stuff that they want you to know. So it's, I, don't, I don't know if that was necessarily intentional. I know sort of the convention is to always put your package level variables and constants at the top, so it might just be an accident. But it's a really cool side effect of that design pattern. You can't even begin to look at how the code works until you read how they want you to understand to use the tool. Um, so whenever you're running a command, one of the first things you probably ask yourself is, you know, what are the flags that I can pass to this? And what you're really asking is, what are the ways in which this tool is configurable because there's no universal constant behavior that could be defined? If, it was, if there was always a right answer to something, it wouldn't be a configurable option. It would just be the way it works. Um, interestingly enough, that's also what the Go tool does as well. The first thing that it does, you know, right on one of the first lines, is it grabs all the flags that you may have passed to it, and it starts to understand what those mean. And the reason why that does that first is because there are various places in the build process where those flags come into play. And again, some of them come into play for the build, and some of them come into play for the run, but they don't all get applied equally. It's not like it interprets the flags once and then sets a bunch of stuff and then forgets about them. At various points in time, some of those flags matter more than others. So there are a lot of flags that you can pass to the Go test tool, as you may, under, as you may know or you may guess. Um, I'm going to cover a few of them now and during the talk, but what I would say is you should really take a look at all of them if you're curious. Uh, I could probably spend an entire talk covering each flag and what it does um, and some of the different ways that they interact together, because some of them do sort of compose behaviors in an interesting way, and I will touch on that. Uh, but I would say if you're really, really curious to see all of the different ways in which you can fiddle with how Go test behaves, definitely take a look at the help text and read through all those flag descriptions, because some of them are pretty cool, and some of them are a little unexpected. Uh, and as I covered before, there are two types of flags. One is to pass to go test, 
and the other is to pass to the test binary itself. And that's just because they are understood and applied differently, and not just differently in terms of where they get applied, but differently in how they get applied and why they matter. So a couple of the flags uh, that I think are pretty cool anyways. Uh, this first one, I have been writing Go for four or so years. I had no idea this flag existed until I wrote this talk. Uh, and so I point that out so that people realize that you shouldn't be afraid to admit that something that you use every day still has a couple of secrets left to yield to you. Um, I use Go a lot. I tell people to write tests. I try to write tests. I had no clue that this flag existed until I just opened the file up and I saw a JSON flag and I said, wow, I had no idea that that existed. That's really cool. And so I have a couple of other slides where I detail uh, some interesting peculiarities about the JSON flag because it really struck me as interesting. Um, but it's a great alternative to parsing the results of the text uh, just raw as they are dumped out into the CLI. Um, there's also a fail fast option, which was added more recently. Uh, this was, a lot of people wanted this, and uh, it got added in recently, and it's actually really cool. Um, it will, as soon as any test fails, the entire run aborts. And this is actually cool for a couple reasons. Uh, I, I like to use this when, for example, I'm doing a big refactor, and I'm like 90% sure I broke a bunch of tests, and I don't really care how many I broke, I just want to see if anything is broken. And oftentimes when you change a bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of tests break, it's kind of like mentally overwhelming, or at least it is for me, like to see all those tests break, it's just like, oh my god, it's so depressing, like I don't want to fix all these tests, it's so sad, I'm, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna quit. Uh, but if you do something like this, you can sort of just like iteratively run one after another. And the benefit of that, in my mind, is at least a lot of times when you do one of these refactors and you get like 20 different failures, 17 of those are probably the same failure. They just show up in a bunch of different places because you were good and you wrote a lot of tests. So it's also a way to sort of just like overall not have to see the cognitive burden of those tests being thrown at you uh, when in reality not as many things broke as you may have thought. Um, that's, it, that's one way to look at how to use this, this flag anyway, and that's how I use it. There's also uh, one called CPU. And what you can do with CPU is you can provide a list of values to provide uh, as uh, values for GoMax procs. So folks who aren't familiar, GoMax procs is how you decide how many OS level threads are running for the schedule which you put Go routines on. So for example, you could basically throttle your application down by setting it to one. Um, and you can provide this in a list so that you don't have to run Go test over and over and over and over and over again with different values. You can just set it as one of the parameters when you run Go test, and it will do that for you. There's also another really interesting one called count. And count is really interesting because it has a bunch of special side effects. One is that if you set count to one explicitly, it will disable caching. You will always run tests uh, anew no matter what if you set count to one. The other cool thing about count is that it actually composes with the CPU flag. So if you've set five different values for your GoMax procs, and you set a count of three, it will run each value for GoMax, the test for GoMax procs three times for one proc, for two procs, for four procs, for eight procs, for 16 procs, et cetera. So it's a really interesting way that you can use to test the concurrency of your code base under multiple different uh, configurations, and then also run them multiple times to try and just make sure that, hey, you didn't get like an accidental pass on a race check. So this is what the JSON output looks like. It might be a little bit hard to read, um, but so if anyone was at my talk yesterday, I talked about a, a library I wrote to learn about broadcasting with channels. This is the benchmarks from that library. Uh, and so I thought it would be interesting if I just showed what it looks like to run these with uh, JSON. And so first look at the bottom one, uh, because this is what you're probably used to seeing. This is what a benchmark uh, outputs normally, as long as it passes. Um, you get some stuff about Go OS, you get some stuff about Go Arc, you get the package name, you get all of your benchmarks, and then you get a you know, general pass, and then OK, the package name, and how, lo how long it ran. And you also get some metadata about how many iterations, and nanoseconds per operation, and bytes per op, and uh, Alex per op. This is running with uh, Benchmem. Um, which is a great way to see uh, the different uh, performance characteristics of your code. But if you look up top, it's a lot more wordy, it's a lot more hard to parse by eye, but it's a, it's a little more machine friendly. Um, but as you'll notice, it, it's also a little bit strange because every single line is its own JSON object. And that's a little bit better than having to parse out lines by hand because at least you have some structure to it. Uh, but it's a little inopportune because now all of this like information is not really clustered together in a single structure. So there are a couple of downsides to JSON that I think are worth calling out. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk lately around um, 
structured events and how uh, when you're logging data out, if you use a structured logger, you can do a lot of really interesting things. You can pipe it to other tools for observability and that sort of thing. And you can do the same sort of thing with this as well. The downside here is though is that the, the level of granularity is actually a little bit too fine, in my opinion. Um, you can actually, if you're curious, there's a package called test to json that I linked uh, right there uh, that gets used in go test if you decide to use the json flag. And what they do is they literally just dump the output to standard out, but then they sort of redirect and capture standard out within test to json. And so uh, you'll even notice if I, I go back real quick, um, you could even see like the, the tab lines that are showing up and the new lines in the text. That's all just because it's captured raw from standard out like that. It's not really specialized or formatted in a, a way that is optimized for uh, large JSON payloads. Um, in my opinion, a slightly more natural approach would be something closer to a single structure per either package or a single structure per, text, uh, per test. And that would get you a couple things. One, it would get you all that metadata all together in one place. And it would also make it easier for you to reconcile this uh, once you get the test output. So if you have to do this right now, um, if you want to use JSON to interpret your test results, um, it is a little bit of work to coordinate those like tests together. There is enough metadata there that you can write your own interpreter that understands and coordinates that data together. Um, but it is, it is a little tricky. And it's still better than trying to parse an unstructured log line, in my opinion. But I think there, there are probably a couple improvements that could be made there. So just, just something to keep in mind with JSON. It's friendlier, but it's not as friendly as I think it could be. Um, so a little bit of a side about the JSON flag. Uh, but let's go back to actually running go test. So we've, we've parsed our flags. We kind of know what the person wants to do. Uh, there's now sort of a series of pre-checks that go test does. And this, this starts to get kind of interesting, and this gets closer to how go build starts to work. And so I'm going to touch on this stuff, and I'm not going to go too deep. Um, Anybody who writes a lot of C code and does a lot of CGO, um, you might be familiar with a concept known as MSAN or memory sanitization. Uh, if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, but you can't run both that and the race detector at the same time. Uh, Go will tell you, no thank you. Uh, you also, if you try to run and build a test with race detection on an unsupported platform, you also get told no thank you. And you might be curious as to what an unsupported platform is. Uh, and the answer to that is actually easier to tell you what the supported platforms are, and that's any 64-bit version of Linux, FreeBSD, Darwin, which is OS X, or Windows. Anything else doesn't get race detection, so sorry. Uh, at least that was true as of when I wrote this slide. I'm not sure if maybe 111 added anything new just yet. Um, but race detection isn't really as widely supported as people might think. And then another pre-check that they do is if you're trying to build something with CGO and for some reason you've passed CGO enabled zero, so you've disabled CGO, Go will rightly tell you again, no thank you, that's not going to work. Uh, and if you need to use CGO but you've disabled it for some reason, you really probably do deserve the OS exit too that Go gives you. Um, so we can sort of keep talking about these pre-checks because there's actually a lot of them. They get deeper and deeper and dive more and more into how the build process works. So I'm just going to go over a couple of these pretty quickly. Um, but there's, there's really a lot of them. And again, the more interested you are in how Go build works, it's actually a really cool thing to dig through how the Go test tool works because it gets you really close to that stuff. And you can go right down deep into that if you want to. Um, so it'll initialize the coverage profile if you've asked for it. And if you haven't seen Go coverage, uh, it's another flag that you can provide, Go test cover. Uh, and it gives you this HTML output that you can use that basically provides a colorized version of all of your code. Red means it's not covered, and green means it's covered. And so you can see line by line how your test is doing with regard to test coverage. Um, another sort of philosophical debate people get into is whether or not test coverage is meaningful or not. Um, again, I really don't have a strong opinion about it. Worry about test coverage or don't, just write tests and make sure that they're good, um, which means that you're writing positive tests and contrapositive tests, so things that fail in the way that you expect and also they succeed in the way that you expect. Um, Go will also then, if you set a timeout, it will make sure that it can understand and parse that into a duration. And then interestingly enough, it adds a minute to it. Um, I didn't really see why it did that, but it does. So uh, it gives you an extra minute just in case. Um, if you explicitly set the timeout to zero, you are actually asking for the timeout to be one century. <laughs> Specifically, you are asking it to be 100 times 365 times 24 times hour. So if you ever set your timeout to zero and you wonder why you're waiting literally one century for that test to fail, <laughs> this is why. 
Uh, and then and this is where we really start hitting the, the, the road in terms of the Go Build stuff. It loads all the packages for designated testing and their dependencies and their dependencies and their dependencies and so on and so forth. Um, so instead of talking about the build process, which again, not qualified to talk about, um, I found a lot of really cool and fun things hidden in the test go command itself. Um, and this, a lot of these were revealed to me by way of comments. And so this sort of underscores another thing that I like to tell people, which is, please write comments, uh, but also comment why you did something and not what something is. Uh, for example, did you know that there is a list of Windows bad words that it avoids using in test binaries? And these are things like uh, setup, patch, install, update, and I probably wouldn't have known why they did this had it not been for a comment that said, Windows actually considers um, binaries or executables with this name to be sort of slightly more or need a slightly higher level of permission to run because they kind of assume if you name something that, uh, it's probably gonna touch or change something on the system. The best way to do security? No, but I mean, it's Windows, so what do you expect? It also has a text file in the build directory to control uh, test cast expiration. And um, the way that it does this is it really just adds a little bit of metadata in that file so that it doesn't have to go and find all the binaries and go look at the last time they were modified, make a determination about it. It sort of uses this as a broad way of saying like, hey, when's the last time I generated uh, tests for this package? All right, yeah, that looks good. I don't have to generate tests. I can use the cache. Or it'll say, oh, that looks pretty old. I'm just going to blow the cache and I'm going to generate these anew without having to actually hit the operating system and examine the, um, examine the binary. Because uh, obviously on every, and I'll get to this in a, a minute, every operating system is a little different. And every time you have to call it to the OS, it's got to be gated and protected and it's more work. It's way easier to just cheat and throw that stuff in a file and look it up later. Uh, it's called test expire.txt and it lives wherever the default cache directory lives. And I'm going to walk through why that's complicated in a second. Um, I also didn't realize that certain imports get rewritten during the build process. This was really cool to me because I didn't really, I didn't know that this happened uh, until I started digging into this. And the three that get rewritten are the C import, the unsafe import, and sync atomic. C actually just translates into runtime slash sego. Unsafe is actually removed entirely because it's what in the comments is called a pseudo package. So again, thank you comments because I did not know that that was a thing. And then sync atomic is already included by default, again, another comment, uh, so it's not imported again. So all because there are these really cool comments that people left behind to sort of detail why something was being done. Uh, I was able to learn a lot about the internals of Go Build without even having to look much in the Go Build process itself. And that was really cool. Uh, but to touch for a second on that cache directory, um, first thing I want to say is uh, there's another speaker who told me she included a corgi in her talk because of the corgis in my talk, and so I told her I would put an elephant in my talk because she is really big in the PHP community. Um, so thank you for coming to my talk and not hers, by the way. Um, the cache never forgets, at least not until you tell it to. Uh, and so where does that cache live? Well, the default is that it will always check if you've set a value called go cache. And if you set go cache, it will put cache files anywhere that you tell it to in there. It will always use that, it will always take that as a single source of truth. But if you haven't set that, this is where we actually start to get into some of the trickier part of writing a compiler and a runtime that is designed out of the box to run on multiple operating systems. Uh, and you actually get a really good appreciation for just how much of a headache it is to have to support that kind of stuff. So if it's on Windows, it could be either in local app data or app data, depending on your version of Windows. If it's OS X, it's in home library caches. If it's Plan 9, for the three people using Plan 9, it's in home lib cache. And the default, which again, according to comments, is quote unquote Unix, it's either in XD cache home, if that's set, otherwise it's in home slash, dollar, uh, home slash dot cache. And then to whatever path that is, unless it's what you set in Go cache, they will add go hyphen build to the path. And that is because Go doesn't want to assume that it has complete control over that directory, but it's Go, so it does want complete control over a directory. So it makes its own little directory in your cache uh, directory wherever you've set that, unless you've explicitly set a Go cache because it believes it can just trust that you have given it a safe place to do anything. And if for whatever reason it can't figure out where the cache directory should live, uh, maybe because it's on an unsupported architecture or because you've disabled caching, it sort of uses this special off value that just tells the rest of the callers uh, who may be interpreting that, like, hey, don't, we're not using cache right now because I don't know of a safe place to cache. So what actually gets put in that directory? Um, it actually has a lot of stuff inside of it. Well, it has what looks like a lot of stuff inside of it. Um, if you open up that directory, you will see 
for every two pair combination of hexadecimal uh, symbols, a directory. So 00, 01, 02, all the way to AA, AB, AC, all the way to FF. And it does this because it's a little bit of a cheap trick that it can use for when it generates a binary, uh, it will look at the first two letters of that binary and it will put it in that directory. So it's always a way for it to sort of like very quickly find where it expects to have written uh, a cached binary. Um, it also will have sometimes, uh, they will end in either an A or a D. Uh, and that just seems to be a little bit of an internal marker that they use. Um, I, couldn't, I didn't notice any specific difference when I examined those cache files with it, but I did notice that there was a distinction there between a hyphen A and a hyphen D. Uh, it also has a readme, which is kind of interesting. However, the readme is really just a note that says, hey, if you're running out of space, you might want to run go clean hyphen cache. Um, so the readme is not really there for you to read and to learn about. It's really like the equivalent of putting a note on the fridge for uh, the night crew who comes in and cleans the office to say, hey, clean out the fridge because it's been two weeks. There's also a log.txt, and this one is actually really cool. I didn't know that it did this uh, until I actually started looking into this. It, every time that it tries to interact with the cache, it actually makes a record in the log about uh, was there a hit, was there a miss, did it have to write something to the cache, et cetera. And while there's probably not a lot of value in this, you could actually use that log file to sort of start to reason about and understand how efficiently you're using the cache when you're doing your builds. So whether or not you care about that is sort of a different argument, but if you're interested in it, you could use this, uh, this log.txt in your go cache directory to just see like, hey, how efficient am I in terms of building? Am I always rebuilding every time? Am I making good use of the cache? Maybe you care about that, maybe you don't. It's an interesting thing you could do, and so there it is. There's also a trim.txt, which stores the last Unix timestamp of when a trim happened, and a trim is really just sort of removing older, unlikely to be used uh, cache files. So it's just another way that it sort of cheats and it writes a little thing to the file system in a file that's very easy to, to read and open, um, and just says, hey, this is the last time that I, I did some cleanup. So we have our test binary. So we probably want to run it. Well, that's if it even built. So if it didn't build, you'll sort of get a failure very quickly that says, you know, hey, such and such, this package failed. Uh, here's the package name, and it will just say build failed. Uh, it will then sort of look, hey, am I running JSON? So we'll do that JSON capture with test to JSON. Uh, and it, will do the, it calls it a local build, uh, but from what I could tell, that's really just saying, like, am I actually building it, or am I uh, using it, am I uh, relying on a cache build? Uh, and it will also check to see if it's doing a, a bench run or not, a, bench, a benchmark run. Uh, and if it's not doing a benchmark run and it's uh, using a cache build, it will potentially alter how it uh, outputs data to standard out, if it is doing parallel executions or not. So if you've set your tests to run with uh, the parallel option, or if you've run go test with the parallel flag, uh, one thing that will happen if you've ever tried to run a bunch of stuff that outputs to standard out and standard error at the same time, they will smash and walk all over each other and you will get a bunch of garbled nonsense that you can't really make any sense of. So this is basically a way for it to say, hey, if I expect that I'm going to be outputting the standard out in a parallel manner, I want to put a lock around that process so that only one thing gets written at a time until it's finished so that I don't just dump out a bunch of failures in the middle of each other so that you can't even tell what passed or what failed. It then looks to see if it has any cached results. And so if it finds cached results, it just stops right there. If it finds a cache that it can use, it just emits them and it moves on. Um, it'll then do some more Seago related stuff. So if you're familiar with Swig, which is a simple wrapper and interface generator, uh, it will uh, do a couple of checks to make sure that a thing called LD library path is set. Again, this starts to get into some more of the build related stuff with Seago and, and the like. Uh, if, again, if you don't, worry about Seago. If you don't really mess with Seago, this is not really a concern for you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you do and you use Swig, you want to make sure that LD library path uh, is set or else Go will not be very happy with you. Uh, and then as it's running your tests, it will sort of block on a wait group uh, on the test command. Or sorry, it will, it will block on the test command uh, asynchronously. And then once the test either finishes, it will obviously give you the results. Uh, but if it times out with that duration that you specified, uh, it will attempt to sig quit. And if that doesn't work, it will just straight up kill the process by calling kill on OS exec. And what's kind of interesting about this is not every operating system and architecture actually supports all the same signals. So on some operating systems, th those signals are effectively nil values that get passed around. So if you're on certain operating systems like Windows and Plan 9, those, some of these signals don't exist. And so you may get some odd behavior if you uh, set a timeout and it doesn't get killed within the right amount of time. So we have a test binary, but you might ask yourself, 
so is this something that I can run by hand? I mean, it's a binary like anything else, right? Shouldn't I be able to run it? And the answer is yes. You actually can run a test binary. Uh, and when you realize this and you start to do it, you look this happy. Um, you might ask, is there a reason to run test binaries by hand? And quite frankly, I haven't run into that. I can see some people shaking their head yes in the audience right now. I personally haven't encountered a big need to do it. Um, I think the most, imp the most uh, reason that I found to do it was just to learn about how test binaries work. Um, so there may be perfectly valid reasons to do it, and if, if you have one of those reasons, you can do it in one of two ways. The first is to use the C flag, which is a special flag for tests, which saves the binary in the current working directory uh, by the name of your package.test. It does not run it, however. It only builds it and places it right where you are. There's another way, which is probably a little bit more familiar to people, which is the O flag, which is how we typically do builds and we put the output wherever we want to put it. This saves the binary in the, name with the, lo in the location with the name that you uh, specified, and it will also run the test for you. So it's sort of a way to say, like, hey, I want to run this by hand myself at some point, but why don't you also just go ahead and run it for me right now just so I know what to expect. But one thing I discovered was it's actually kind of interesting where these tests run from. And you might think, well, you know, I built them. They should run exactly where I built them from. But that's not always the case. If you write, if you write a test that just prints out OS exec, uh, executable, and I do have some examples of this in uh, my quiz um, uh, repository, if you build it with the C flag and you invoke the binary and you print out OS exec, uh, you always get it running from the physical location you saved it at. There's, there's really, I couldn't find a way to make that change. That was always uh, very consistent. However, with the O flag, it depends. Is this a fresh build, so it's changed, something changed, it's busting the cache, it's not relying on what it has? Then it actually runs uh, from a special build directory where it places build artifacts. However, if you're doing a cached build, if this is a build that has already happened, you've already saved it, uh, then it's always the physical location you specified on disk. So if you put it in your own home directory, it's from there. If you put it in you know, user bin, it's there, et cetera, so forth. Um, so it's really interesting some of the ways in which Go decides to run from where you save it and some of the ways in which Go decides to run from where it built it. So we've written some tests, we've built our binaries, we've run them. How about getting the results? Where do all those fails that we're also familiar with, well, that I'm familiar with anyways, come from? So you might be surprised to learn that it's actually not as clear cut as it might think. Uh, it's not really like there's a sort of a, a unique uh, test, gather, and build, and display the output sort of phase. Uh, displaying the output is spread out across a couple of places, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and that is so that Go can optimize for giving you the results of tests right away. So if you have a, a really long test run, so let's say you expect it to run for that full century, um, you don't want to wait that whole century to get your test results. You want to at least be able to get some of those results early so that you know that it's working. Because, you know, how many times have you just been waiting the entire century for your test results to finish only to find that the build didn't work? I mean, who hasn't been there, am I right? Um, so if there are a couple of quick checks that it does. One is that if there's no files found, it'll just say, I this package, no test files found. It'll then check to see in the test files if there are any eligible tests to run. If there are no eligible tests to run, it says no tests to run. So a little bit of a distinction about the messages it gives you as it goes to output. Uh, and then there's also a really interesting one, and this, this actually caught us at work uh, the other day. There was a test that we had, and there are reasons why we did this, basically took all the output and wrote it to IOUtil discard. Uh, again, there are reasons why you do that sometimes. Uh, but so the test had literally no output, but it was failing. So what Go does in that case is it just says, it just reports the exit code of the binary, which is exit one, not super helpful when you have no output uh, and you just see an exit one with absolutely no description. So be careful if you have somehow silenced the output from your tests uh, because you will get very confusing, uh, very confusing results um, once you start to output. But what surprised me about this was there was no like clean, hey, here's where I'm outputting phase, or there's no clean like, hey, here's the structure of what a test output looks like, and now I'm going to fill in that struct and dump it out to standard out. It's intermixed between a bunch of other steps. And again, as, as far as I could tell, this is so that Go can optimize for giving you those results as fast as it can, so that you're not sitting there waiting forever to find out nothing worked. And so I want to finish with that cool party trick that I promised would impress your friends and improve your testing. Um, because again, you have cool friends who like to write tests. So retouching that, uh, that idea of the package-specific test, so package underscore test. Um, you know, we talked about two ways to write tests. There's inside the package, and there's inside package test. 
Again, both are fine. However, a lot of people really prefer that underscore test package. And I think in a lot of ways that's because a lot of us grew up with the idea of black box testing. You test the surface area of something because that's what everybody else is going to be using. And there's a lot of wisdom behind that. But there's also a lot of value in testing the things that are just under the covers of your test as well, or just under the covers of, of, your, exported, um, of your exported code. And so if you do this, it means that you're, you're not going to be able to test any of that unexported, potentially important or critical code, or can you? And obviously the answer is yes, you can. Um, so <laughs> when compiling Go tests, Go treats the underscore test Go files with a special set of rules. Um, they only come into play when building test binary, so they don't matter when you're building the package, the A file, or when you're building an actual binary, uh, and they only get included for the package actively under test, so for the package that corresponds to that test binary. Um, t the underscore test.go files in the dependencies of your package do not get included, so this is only a trick that you can apply for the tests that matter for the, for the package un currently under test. And when you combine all these things together, a test package uh, with these uh, test files uh, and package tests with regular packages, you get a very interesting behavior that emerges. Uh, and what you find is the test files are your friends. So if you have two packages, p and p underscore test, in p you have, let's say, a type t, and attached to that you have an unexported method called secret stuff, uh, which is a great name for a method. You should all name your methods that way. Uh, and then you define a p, test, uh, p underscore test dot go file. However, you do not put that in the test package. You put that in the main package. And inside of that, you provide one function. You can provide as many functions as you want, quite honestly, but for the sake of this argument. Uh, as a receiver on T, you now wrap that private unexported method with a public one. You can choose to name it the same thing or not. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. It works either way. Um, it, but typically, it's good documentation to do it this way. Um, now, in the ptest package, you can call the publicly exported method that will ferry to the privately uh, unexported method. Uh, and a reminder that this only works for the package actively under test. So you can only do this for the test binary that corresponds to the package you're testing. And I have an example of this in, uh, in a subrepo called Trick, uh, if anybody wants to see this and play around with it. Uh, and I want to give actually a shout out to Florin, a DL Sniper from the Gopher Slack. He's the one who actually taught me about this when I was complaining about Go test one day. Um, so to recap, in case you're on the phone the entire time, which is fine, I'm on my phone a lot. Um, so. Go tests your code by producing test binaries, which are these special wrappers that fit around test benchmark and example functions. Uh, there are a ton of interesting flags to check out, so you should do that. There's way too many to list. Some affect how the tests are built. Some affect how the tests are run. Uh, there is no Godoc or man page for the tool. You really just have to use the help flag. Uh, the examples are very, very particular. So how you write examples have to be very, very particularly done, or else they do not work. You can produce your own test binaries, although normally I would say you don't need to, but there are probably cases where you want to. Um, caching is a little more complicated than you might think, and that has to do with any time you need to hit the operating system specifically, Go has a lot of abstraction over that because it's, uh, it's so endemic to Go to be um, multi-architecture supported right, right from the, uh, the core. Uh, the Go test command itself is optimized to reduce the time to first result so that you start getting results as soon as possible and you don't question whether or not it's working. You should be careful how you name things or you get very confusing errors, so make sure that your test files have an underscore in them or else they won't work and you will be confused, or at least I will be. The JSON output is nifty, but I think it could be a little bit better structured if I had one criticism. Uh, and you could do some really clever things by composing underscore test files, normal packages, and test packages. And that's go test under the hood. Thank you, everybody.